This is the DeFi Decoded Podcast by Nine Point Partners in cooperation with Prophecy DeFi. The ideas and opinions expressed in this podcast should not be taken as investment advice. Always consult with your financial advisor before investing. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of uh, the DeFi Decoded Podcast. I am Alex Tapscott here with Andrew Young. Lots going on in the world of crypto and Web3. So let's jump right into it. Andrew, what's going on? I mean, you tell me. You just got back from uh, Turkey. How was it? <laughs> well, yeah, I guess we can start there. Um, yeah, so I was in Turkey this week. I went to give a talk at the Turkish Capital Markets Congress. I was the keynote speaker there along with uh, the Minister of Finance for Turkey. It was really interesting and uh, an eye-opening experience for me. It's not the first time I've been to Turkey. It's the third time, though the first time I was 11 years old. So not super relevant to this discussion. Um, This time around though, the last time was about three and a half years ago. At the time, the US dollar and the Turkish lira were trading at about a four to one ratio. And when I went back, it was around 18.5 to one. So the past few years, the country has suffered from some pretty terrible inflation, um, largely driven by uh, government policy. There's been sort of a, a like a, a, a bout of massive over, inve- over um, investment in the country, uh, you know, a lot of heavy borrowing and some interference by the government into the workings of the central bank. And so there's basically some questioning of whether or not there's central bank neutrality. And as a result, there's a lot of capital flight from foreign investors. And so the whole country is sort of suffering from a couple of big issues. Um, but like the net effect of all of this is that crypto is top of mind in Turkey. Um, during a period of, of like quite acute uh, pr- currency uh, devaluation, the biggest trading pair in Turkey was actually the lira to the US to USDT, and then after that the euro, and then after that Bitcoin. So cryptos rounded out the top three uh, major trading pairs, the lira during that period of time. The situation today is a little more steady, but still you see crypto everywhere you go. I went to the Grand Bazaar in Istanbul, which is this like ancient market that's been around since the Ottoman uh, conquest of the Byzantine Empire, I think like 1450 or something like that. And um, in addition to a bunch of trinket shops, there's a half a dozen uh, Forex storefronts that all prominently display Bitcoin as sort of like their big marketing thing. And one of them is just a guy behind a laptop who allows you to go and trade crypto. So people are looking for ways to, you know, move and store value in something other than Liras, and it's just sort of interesting that you know this the city Istanbul, which is thousands of years old and has been you know the cross section of of trade routes between Europe and the Middle East and Asia for for millennia, is now sort of at the crossroads of of this you know monetary revolution in in crypto assets. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I will also say that speaking to like senior executives, the big sponsor for the event was a company called Akbank, which is one of the three largest lenders and financial firms in, in the country. And um, the the level of sophistication within the average like executive at that firm like that was way ahead of what I've experienced in any traditional financial firm in North America, and certainly in, in Europe. Um, I had people asking me, questions about, you know, specific questions about, about DeFi and stable coins and, you know, about FTX, they were all incredibly knowledgeable what was going on. And, you know, sometimes in the traditional finance, people bring up recent events to dunk on crypto, like to say like FTX is, isn't that proof that this whole thing is like not ready for prime time. In their case, they were talking about, isn't that just proof that, you know, we can't rely on these, these custodial companies that are not properly regulated. And, you know, we got to, come up with better solutions. So I don't know, I just, I was, I left the the um, country feeling really like more bullish on the space, um, more bullish on crypto as a store of value trade. Uh, we forget in places like Toronto that in other parts of the world, you know, accessing financial services is difficult. Local currencies are hyperinflationary. Governments can kind of arbitrarily intervene in the economy and sometimes in people's like personal financial lives. In ways that's really harmful. So I'm very very bullish on that front. And then just in general, you know, the idea that um, it's early, but there's now like a a lot of knowledge in at the institutional level, at the enterprise level, in many different parts of the world, which is kind of illuminating. So all in all, very very cool trip. And obviously, like I would highly recommend to anybody <laughs> that they go to Turkey and go to Istanbul because it's just a rad town. Like it's awesome. It's like 15 million people. It's, you know, it feels like a huge European capital. It's got a 2000 year history and it's got great food and it's a great place. So it was nice to be back. 
So is it, uh, I mean, as you brought up, um, Tether was the main sort of trading pair in the, in the, with, with the Turkish Lira at one point. Um, and uh, it's, it's been a huge center for sort of Bitcoin and, and Tether specifically, but any other yeah. sort of cryptos that were mentioned, or is it mostly just stable coins and Bitcoin? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I would say it's mostly Bitcoin and, and stable coins, um, or at least that's what sort of pop, most popular um, and most well understood, which honestly is kind of the case here too. Um, you know, if, I, I didn't have a chance. I wasn't spending time with a what I would call a, a crypto native group of people, right? So these were not entrepreneurs uh, who were building DeFi stuff. These were, you know, bankers and and um, and other people. You know, I can I have a list of business cards, like the country head for IBM, the country head for KPMG, the head of the stock exchange, uh, the board of the directors of some other banks. So like these are like these are like traditional financial. Um, you know, people, traditional enterprise people. So um, they weren't talking to me about, um, you know, this kind of stuff you talk to me about, <laughs> which I don't understand half the time. Um, they were talking to me about, you know, the bread and butter of, of crypto, um, which even in of itself was, was worth uh, worth noting for sure. That's interesting. Yeah, I know it's, uh, I, it does seem like Turkey, um, I'm, I'm also just curious, I guess, before we switch off this topic is, um, is the momentum still really strong? Because I feel like to me, Turkey at one point was one of the biggest stories kind of within the Bitcoin and crypto space. And then it, it sort of tailed off a little bit, I feel like, at least on a relative scale. Uh, and maybe that's just because Bitcoin has become sort of a smaller and smaller piece of the puzzle. Um, I'm just kind of curious, is it is it mostly for savings to keep, to keep sort of their crypto, uh, their purchasing power uh, safe in a highly inflationary environment? Is it remittances kind of like the Philippines and, and, and Thailand? Um, I'm just kind of curious, like what is the, the killer use case within Turkey for uh, for Bitcoin and, and I guess Tether? Yeah, well, I'd, I'd say for for the those two, it's the store of value trade. I don't think it's so much remittances. Like I there is a there's a Turkish diaspora out there in the world, but it's not like in the Philippines where 20% of the GDP of the Philippines is remittances. You know, Turkey's, I don't think Turkey has that. Um, it's not, that's not like how it's, that's not, doesn't characterize the country's economy. Um, so yeah, I think it's very much just, you know, you're earning money in Lira, the Lira's um, losing value. You're looking for places to park it or move it um, to somewhere safe. And these are payment rail, they're rails to move it, but they're also means to store it as well, right? Have you ever been to uh, the country? No, I haven't been yet. Uh... It seems like a great place, or at least a very cool place to check out. Um, yeah, it's right up your alley. Yeah. Place yeah. to stay late. You can get into lots of trouble. I know you like to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I was yeah. in, closest I've got, I've been to Greece uh, last summer. Oh, but, yeah. don't tell the Turks that Greece is close to, to Turkey and, and anything other than geography. They're, they're like, <laughs> they don't like each other very much is another thing. I was reminded of when I was over there. But anyway, I digress. So there was something, uh, an announcement that you made as well on the SX front um, that seemed to get a lot of attention on on Twitter. It's nice to see that people are still shipping in this bear market. So you want to tell us about that? Yeah, so we uh, yesterday we released the SX Merge, which is our roadmap to fully decentralize the SX network ecosystem and SX uh, application. And um, And so essentially, the way it works is we're going to be so SX is obviously a prediction market. It's the largest blockchain prediction market in the world now. And um, what we want to do with the SX merge is actually have the uh, SX network validators. So these are the guys who validate the chain, make our chain sort of function. Um, they have a similar uh, sort of role in the ecosystem that uh, I guess miners in the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem play, or obviously. Uh, validators in the Ethereum ecosystem play as a, as a proof of stake system. But uh, what's interesting with SX versus these more sort of general purpose uh, L1s or blockchains is we're going to be actually using the validators to decentralize the functionality of our underlying application or DAP, uh, hmm. as, as some call it. Um, and this sort of fits into this thesis that I've been, uh, I mean, both of us have been hammering for the last year, um, which is I think the next big bull market cycle is going to be uh, driven by application specific blockchains. Um, so kind of how we had DeFi summer in 2020 uh, to get us out of the prior bear market. 
Uh, I'm a big believer that we'll have sort of an app chain summer at some point. Um, and the reason why is uh, app chains allow you to create a fully decentralized application, uh, which is highly unique and a better user experience. Um, and also gives you the sort of security guarantees of decentralization. But rather than um, trying to decentralize uh, everything, but on a sort of generic chain that you don't control, which is kind of how the vast majority of blockchain applications are designed today. Um, if you vertically integrate it with the validators themselves, you can uh, you can actually decent decentralize the functionality of the chain um, at a level that doesn't sacrifice performance the way that fully on-chain applications do now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm really, really excited about this. And um, it's uh, we're, we're obviously trying to be pioneers in the space and um, trying to push the bleeding edge in terms of what's possible. And so there's a lot of stuff we have to do. Um, it's broken into three phases. We're focusing by uh, effectively creating a decentralized Oracle in phase mm -hmm. one. Um, and so having, uh, our validators run their own data feeds uh, and provide essentially essentially act as an oracle, which for people who don't know is essentially like a decentralized API. Uh, the second phase is they are going to be decentralizing the order book. So the validators will store order book memory uh, directly. And uh, I mean, this is, that's like a whole project on itself as well, uh, but we're pretty excited about that. Um, that will allow us to create a, um, a fully sort of decentralized uh, central limit order book uh, type yeah. exchange, uh, just because obviously AMMs have a lot of issues. Uh, order books fix a lot of those issues, but they're centralized. And so this is kind of the best of both worlds. Uh, and then finally, the last phase is decentralizing the front end, uh, which in a lot of ways is actually the easiest piece. Uh, that includes open sourcing the front end, uh, making it easy for people to launch uh, their own sort of front ends, branded skins, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so it's really three phases. Um, the first phase probably being expected to be the most difficult. And then sort of second phase should be pretty challenging, but I think we have a roadmap for that. And then finally, the third phase is relatively easy. Well, let's go through it one by one. So the idea of decentralizing the oracles is really interesting. So like, I think for, for people who like aren't aware of what this is, so you, you said it's like an API. Basically, it's like, if you're if you've got like a decentralized application that relies on data from that's off chain, right? That data from like the real world, you need like a way to like input that data into a contract, right? You need a way to like validate or to you know have a reliable data stream. So, like in the case of SX um, network, any prediction market, it could be everything from you know what's the what's the temperature going to be next Sunday to like what's the outcome of a political event to like what's the outcome of a sporting event to like a million things right what's the price of a security etc like you're making predictions about things so you need like a way to create um like a data feed for that and so you know I think one of the criticisms criticisms is that you know or oracles are like a centralized sort of like point of of failure unreliability or whatever so um, is that a fair characterization? And like, how does what does decentralizing the Oracle function do to, to help overcome that? Yeah, so decentralizing the Oracle, um, again, this is there's actually projects that have already created decentralized Oracles. Uh, we're going to be the first ones to actually build in uh, the base layer itself. Uh, obviously, there's things like Chainlink, which exist, um, yeah. which uh, it's almost like you create a proof of stake system, but um, it's for providing data feeds versus verifying the chain. Yeah. Um, and then you essentially, uh, it, it makes a lot of the same assumptions that proof of stake does in the sense that 51% of the, uh, sort of whatever the majority agrees is, is, is consensus. Um, and you have to put in sort of, uh, incentives and penalties to prevent, uh, people from 51% attacking the network, uh, mm -hmm. to be, to be malicious, uh, which you can do by making them lock up tokens and having slashing penalties and things like that. So. Uh, in a lot of ways, it's, it's not, uh, it's it's very similar to things that have already been built. Mm -hmm. um, the, the core innovation is really just the vertical integration of having it built in directly to the chain. Um, in terms of uh, how it works, uh, so essentially the validators who are currently validating our chain right now, they will be uh, running a client, essentially this data client feed is what we call it. Yep. Uh, it will be pulling in uh, sports, politics, uh, current events data, uh, uh, and allows them to sort of input it into the market infrastructure that we built through the SX protocol. Mm -hmm. And the idea there is over time, um, there'll be a variety of different 
data client feeds that people are running, which will make the reporting far more secure and far more robust to errors and things like that, which uh, can happen all the time. Um, and so it's kind of like it's safety through diversification is sort of how I describe it. Yeah, I like that. And then just one other question I had, which is, you mentioned that, you know, order books could be a better option than AMMs. Does that mean that like your order book could eventually go be used beyond prediction markets and be used as like a general like market making function for other assets? Uh, I think we're, we're very focused on prediction markets. Obviously that's like our core focus. And yeah. uh, if you know me, I'm all about specialization given my yeah. fo focus on application specific chains. Um, I think prediction markets are um, sort of an unambiguous good for society. There's a lot of things we can use prediction markets for beyond just the obvious use case of sports and politics. Um, we've, we've sort of experimented with using them in uh, governance. So what people call decision markets or future key. So actually allowing, uh, rather than having people vote on decisions, you create prediction markets. Uh, and then essentially you let the markets decide what they think the right decision is. Um, and allows you to scale up a sort of uh, highly incentivized uh, governance system where everyone has skin in the game and, uh, and you get much higher participation than you currently see in traditional blockchain voting systems. So I'm really excited about all that type of stuff. Yeah. Um, for us, I like we're we're again we're focused on uh, prediction markets. We do have some DeFi applications coming on SX network. I kind of view DeFi now as almost like a it's almost like a supporting industry in the sense that every blockchain, uh, no matter if it's gaming, NFTs, uh, prediction markets, really anything, they'll probably have a, its own supporting DeFi ecosystem uh, just to just to make the the chain work in a way. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I'm starting to think that, uh, potentially there may, that may be true of NFTs as well. So every, even application specific blockchains, um, will probably have their own NFT layer as well, even if it's not designed around NFTs, hmm. um, which is sort of a, sort of an interesting idea. Um, and yeah. And so, yeah, that's kind of how, how we've built it out. And uh, like, we've talked a lot, I mean, we've talked to a number of people in the Cosmos ecosystem. And um, I think that's something that's kind of the viewpoint that's shared pretty commonly within the Cosmos ecosystem. And I think yeah. it's slowly filtering out to the rest of the crypto community. But um, like from where we stand, I mean, we talk to people in the Cosmos ecosystem all the time. Um, so it's kind of it seems obvious to us, but it's still very much, I would say, a contrarian, uh, very much a contrarian take. Uh, most people are still very focused on Ethereum layer twos, yeah. um, which to me are just sort of, they're still generalized chains. They're just obviously cheaper. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I, I, I don't know where it goes. Um, some people have brought up maybe, maybe the future is a combo of both. So rather than application, application specific blockchains, there'll be application specific layer twos. Mm -hmm. They're sort of combining the best of Cosmos and the Ethereum ecosystem into, into one. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I don't know, I don't know what's going to happen over the next, uh, I suspect a lot of projects will sort of shut down and a lot of capital will rotate to new projects, but I do think wh whenever the next crypto bull market comes, I think app chains are going to be at the forefront of it. Hmm. I like that. I like the thesis. And I also like the idea that like, you know, we're in this period of quiet and, and some new, new narratives are going to emerge, but also new capabilities, right? Like new kinds of applications that maybe weren't possible before. And um, I also like the idea, like the way you describe prediction markets as being useful today and having product market fit today in some areas, but that they have applications beyond that. I think that's really helpful for people to understand too. Um, yeah, so very, very interesting. Hey, have you, uh, have you seen anything about chat GPT over the past little while? Um, I was debating just doing this podcast where I talk to the AI instead of to you. Um, is the, the AI pays more attention to what I say and cares more <laughs> about my feelings than you do. So I was thinking maybe, we could, maybe chat, me and chat GPT could have a conversation or, or we should rename it Chad GPT. You just have yeah. a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. It's time for a Chad GPT. We need uh, a Chad, I think... I'm going to start a new podcast called Chad GPT, where I just talk to the G to the, to the AI and I ask it questions, her questions about things but yeah, uh, i think uh like one thing that's cool about gpt um uh, i mean it's obviously incredible if anyone hasn't checked it out um 
it uh like one thing that we were experimenting with over the weekend is you can you can literally get it to code you like a simple amm contract uh yeah. on solidity and it will just pump it out and you can get it to audit contracts people are using it to try to find bugs in smart contracts to see if there's an exploit that they can take advantage of um, which is completely insane yeah, exactly. uh, but one thing that uh gpt is not very good at actually it's not even very much capable is prediction um and so yeah so it's interesting like in the future maybe um, maybe prediction markets are kind of the thing that's needed for it to be able to do prediction in the future. Like if you ask it a question about the future, it sort of instantaneously spins up a prediction market. Um, and, uh, uh, and then that's, and then that's actually how, uh, AIs are able to make predictions. But that's uh, not what it does now. Like, no, 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 for I've sure. Been, I've been fooling around with it too. And like, if anything, the data it has is, is up to maybe like six months ago as well. So it's so funny. It's like describe like describe the Toronto Raptors uh, 2002, 22, 23 season so far. It actually cannot provide you like any useful information about that, which is sort of interesting. But um, you know, it can tell you like a lot of other stuff. I've been I've been screwing around with it, and it's it's very fun. It it almost like reminds me. It, it people making the comparison to, to you know Google search and the big breakthrough. In a way, it kind of reminds me of Twitter a little bit, where it's like, you know, Twitter makes you twice as informed and half as productive. I feel like Chat GPT is making me like twice as informed in a way, because I'm it's giving me answers, but like I'm spending half the time just literally making it tell me jokes and do stupid stuff um, instead of doing anything productive. By the way, I heard that um they say that it's like nine cents per query. So like I've already like put a I've already played like a three dollar tab or five dollar tab on. <laughs> open AI, open AI from me, just like screwing around with it over the weekend. So they're going to have to monetize this eventually. Anyway, it's pretty cool. We should bring on uh, co-host Chad GPT for the next episode and see if uh, she's got anything to say on the, on the subject. That's it for this week's DeFi Decoded. Thanks for joining us. We've got a great guest uh, next week and uh, actually quite a few really good guests going to the end of the year. Um, everything from you know, uh, leading DeFi entrepreneur to a Hollywood screenwriter. So it's going to be a pretty cool sort of wrap up to the year. We're going to make some predictions for what's coming in 2023 and beyond. Until then, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Bye. The information contained herein does not constitute an offer or solicitation by anyone in the United States or in any other jurisdiction in which such an offer or solicitation is not authorized or to any person to whom it is unlawful to make such an offer or solicitation. Prospective investors who are not residents in Canada should contact their financial advisor to determine whether securities of the funds may be lawfully sold in their jurisdiction.